This first session is meant to be really an introduction to the course, and it's going to be a bit autobiographical as I talk about how I came to explore this topic. But I'm also going to share some interesting insights and, and comments and things like that along the way. So um, there will be about a, a 30 to 60 second pause as I rearrange the screen and I get the presentation up. I will turn my video off, but you should still hear me. So here we go. This is a pretty bare bones presentation. I try to keep things rather simple um, when I'm presenting just to uh, be sensitive to the bandwidth and so forth. So you're not going to see a lot of fancy graphics or, or anything like that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I, um, I'm, I'm delighted to explore this topic with, with such a large group and such a diverse group. I don't know how many of you have been in the Google Plus community so far, but we have people from a number of different countries. I think I've counted at least nine, maybe 12 different countries. Um, and that's fascinating because I'm sure that there are different grading practices and different approaches to assessment in, in different uh, education systems. <clears throat> in fact, that's actually part of the research that I've not explored as much. I've looked at this topic from an, an historical perspective, and I spent a lot of time reading the literature that's largely available in the databases that, that I access, but I've not necessarily explored um, uh, the comparative education approach to this very much. So I'm interested in the insights that people in the, in the group can contribute to that part of the topic. I'd like to start with a book. I don't know how many of you have seen or read this book. If you have, please feel free to type in the chat. You can type yes if you've read it, no if you've not, or maybe I've heard of it, something like that. I always like to have a little audience participation. So um, if you've, if you've uh, seen this book before, let me know. It's a self-published text, and so it's not well known. And I've seen a couple of reviews that were not necessarily positive about it because sometimes going through self-publishing, it can have some typos or some errors here and there that don't get picked up as easily. Uh, it might not go through as rigorous of a um, editing process sometimes. But um, if one's willing to look beyond that a little bit, there are some really fascinating ideas. One need not agree with all of it to, um, to read it and to benefit from it. But the book Inevitable Mass Customized Learning Takes this, it uses this phrase mass customized learning and it's contrasting that with sort of mass production, that industrial model versus this sort of post-industrial model of education. And they're talking about, they're making some predictions and they're casting a vision for some possibilities for learning environments. And the part that I wanted to share from this book as we get started though, is in the text, they talk about the concept of load bearing walls. And if any of you uh, know a little bit about construction, you understand that a load-bearing wall is of significance because it's a wall that bears a heavy load. And if one were to just tear out that wall, it could um, jeopardize the integrity of the entire building. You might have something falling down on you. Um, and so it, it's rather important for people to reinforce the um, areas. For example, if you look in this picture, you can see a little thicker beam going across at, at the top there. That's sort of reinforcing. That's probably where the, the load is being uh, carried. And, uh, the, and the authors of this book use that analogy to talk about educational systems and schools and educational institutions. What they suggest is that within our contemporary educational institutions in, in each culture, there are, there are these load-bearing walls or load-bearing policies, processes, procedures, practices that exist within our institutions. And as we think about innovation and as we think about uh, experimentation and new possibilities in our learning environments, it's reckless to simply go in and to flippantly tear out walls or policies and procedures and practices without taking some time to investigate where the load-bearing walls are. What are the things that hold up the institution or sort of hold it together the way that it, that it functions now? So they don't suggest that you can't remove those load-bearing walls, but it takes care and it takes attention to detail. So if one is renovating a home like this, they would put some kind of support as they removed the previous walls and that support would hold things together until they can get a new type of wall in place or the new construction in place so that there's integrity in the home. 
And in the text, they suggest a similar thing, that when we're talking about innovations and different and changes in our schools, we want to uh, be careful when we're removing those practices, policies, and procedures, and uh, make sure that we reinforce with something that's just as robust and that's going to work for the system. And that's not a simple, change management is obviously not a simple thing. I know from the different people in this course and that we have a, a lot of people who have been involved in educational leadership and, and you could probably resonate with, this, with these kinds of ideas of, of change management. Um, another, another concept in terms of change comes from um, Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School and he's written The Innovative University and um, on the K-12 level, Disrupting Class. He's written other books like The Innovator's DNA. Clayton Christensen is most known for this concept of disruptive innovations, not disruptive in terms of kind of causing problems, but disruptive in the sense that it transforms an industry or an enterprise. And in the two books that I just mentioned, The Innovative University and Disrupting Class, Christensen talks a little bit about how technology may begin to disrupt um, the educational institution. Well, back to this book, Inevitable, and the concept of load-bearing walls. They list a number of what they consider to be common load-bearing walls in educational institutions, but one of them is the letter grade system. They argue that the letter grade system is one of those things that we've come to depend upon uh, quite a bit. And... Um, and there are, are some of us who think that there might be some more effective possibilities out there. But um, as with this metaphor, it would not be responsible for us just to kind of run into an institution and somehow demand or dictate that we should just get rid of letter grades altogether. It might not be the great option, uh, the best option in all contexts and situations. Um, but instead, perhaps we can approach this a little more cautiously. Now I have an undergraduate degree in history and a master's degree in humanities where it's sort of interdisciplinary studies where I also studied the history of technology. And <clears throat> then my doctorate is in instructional technology. So as I approached this topic initially, I approached it with a little bit of that budding historian in me, as well as um, the, uh, the educational technologist. So I hope you'll humor me as I approach it from both standpoints. I think that I've sort of redefined educational technology to allow me to study anything that I want in education. Uh, so the word technology is really, some people define it, and I think I mentioned this in one of the videos in the course, they define technology as applied scientific knowledge. Others will expand that to applied systematic knowledge, so it's not necessarily using the um, scientific method in, in all cases. Um, but then, if that's the case, educational technology would be applied systematic knowledge in the field of education. So as an educational technologist, I don't just study technologies like a computer or an interactive whiteboard or student response pads or things like that. I also study technologies in the form of concepts or ideas and policies and procedures. And the letter grade system, from that perspective, is a technology. It's, a, it's applied systematic knowledge in the field of education. It's a system that's been generated to document some kind of performance related to students. And, um, and it's a technology that served people for quite some time. And many people have been quite content with it. But I'm approaching it from that technological standpoint. The other angle that I bring to this is um, my addiction to studying um, what we would call neo-Luddites, or even the historic Luddite movement. Uh, the concept or the term comes, goes back quite some time when uh, the uh, textile workers found themselves getting replaced by a number of machines. And uh, the word Ludd comes from this sort of mythic character, Ned Ludd, who um, sort of rallied the troops and they went into these uh, some of these textile companies and, and they destroyed uh, some of the machines that were replacing their jobs and they really struggled with it. Um, and there are many people who talk about uh, sort of the, that's the Faustian bargain of technology. Sometimes technology disrupts lifestyles and people's lives and, and the way that they think and they function. There's one story related to that that's very interesting to me. 
it's the idea, it's a history, and I forget which text it comes from. I'm, I try to be really intentional about citing my sources, so I apologize, apologize. I'll try to look it up and see if I can figure out where I first heard it. But it was the story of the tomato picker. So farmers, as they wanted to make sure that they, they wanted to grow more and they wanted to um, um, and they be able to, to gather the tomatoes and to sell them and, and to really reduce costs. And, and at one point, an inventor came up with the concept of a tomato picker. So rather than people walking through the fields hand picking the tomatoes, this was something that could be pulled on a tractor and it would sort of ride high and it would, it would pull the tomatoes from the plants. And it could pull, you know, it could do the work of a dozen people in half the time. Um, and please know I just made up those numbers, those stats, a dozen in half the time. You get the general point that it could, uh, um, it could pick more than, than a group of, of people, and it was saving them money. Um, now, here's the part that's inter interesting. When I heard that story, what was illustrated to me, though, is that there was a problem with the tomato picker. Because the tomato picker was sort of rough on the tomatoes, and it would bruise them. And so what they had to do is they had to breed a tomato with a thicker skin that was tougher so it wouldn't be, de it wouldn't be destroyed by the tomato picker. Unfortunately, that's also a tomato that, had, uh, that also became a tomato that did not have the same kind of flavor as the tomatoes of the past. So um, that's an interesting idea because now that's why I don't know if any of you have, grow tomatoes in your garden. But a homegrown tomato just tastes so much better than what we often find in um, in the grocery store or the market or um, the grocery store in particular, and uh, and some people would argue that that's that's what happened. That's the Faustian bargain. There was a give and a take. There were some benefits to the new technology, but some things were lost. So I use that same approach when I study any technology, including the letter grade system. I never assume that a technology is all good or that it's all bad, and I tend to not use words like good or bad. Instead, I like to use the phrase affordance, or the phrase affordances and limitations. Affordances would be the things that it allows us to accomplish, that without it, it would be difficult to accomplish those things. And limitations would be those things that it prevents us from accomplishing when we use it. I would argue that every technology has affordances and limitations. It has benefits and drawbacks. And the letter grade system is no exception to that, which is the reason for this course. A chance for us to not say, let's get rid of the letter grade system, but let's honestly explore and consider the limitations and the benefits of letter grades. But alongside it, why not consider some of the possibilities that can be used to enhance the letter grade system or maybe in some cases, people might consider replacing the letter grade system with one of these alternatives. Now, I haven't chosen all of those in this class, but I've chosen a good number of them. And, um, and so let me take you on the next journey then. Talking about affordances and limitations, I also approach this as a, as, um, a person who sort of identifies with being a historian, even though I don't have graduate study in that area or formal graduate study in that area. Um, I'd like to share this picture with you, and I share this picture in many presentations. If you've been in a presentation with me before, you've probably seen this one before. It works so well for so many purposes, I just can't get rid of it. So I'd like to give you a moment, and in the chat box below, let's get some guesses about what you think it is. If you've heard me before, please don't give it away yet, but let's get some guesses. Oh, you've seen the video already, Beth, okay. <laughs> I think I, I alluded to, I mentioned it in the video, but I didn't show it. <clears throat> so, so many of you having seen the video may know that this is a cutting edge technology of its time, the skull saw. Um, and as I mentioned in the video, yes, it is a chainsaw, Michelle. <laughs> um, right. So um, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the video, few of us would go to the doctor who insisted on using this cutting edge technology of its day. There are new and improved technologies available. And that, again, as I mentioned in the video, is part of why we're exploring this topic in the course. Because I suspect that there are some new technologies, some new um, approaches, some new scientific and systematic knowledge that can help us approach this idea of assessment and feedback and um, documenting student performance. 
So my journey started a little bit historically, and I started, and I hope this is a little bit interesting to you, um, <clears throat> but uh, I know some people don't get excited about history, but I think you'll find this relevant um, to the course, and it does help. I find I use history a great deal when I help organizations, when I consult with organizations and help them consider changes, because sometimes people don't realize how, um, how new or recent um, a, a practice is. We often think that the way we do it today is how it has always been done. But in the modern education system, there are very few things that we use today that are more than a couple of hundred years old when it comes to technologies. And the letter grade system is one of those. We can find little examples of it in, in different times and eras and so forth. So for the report card, for example, um, if we go back through history uh, and look at different report cards, if we go back far enough and there weren't report cards, people would be assessed by having to repeat the classics from memory, or they would have to uh, write the classics, in, uh, write an essay in the style of the classics that they read. In the 1820s, people had to, um, they had a lot of oral examinations, and there's a reason why before the 1820s, most of the examinations were oral, because the pen and, and ink, or the quill and, and, and the ink, that, uh, that wasn't always uh, the most effective technology with a large group of people. And so oral exams were the only option. And prior to the, the blackboard, where a teacher could have students go and write answers up on the board, um, or on those small boards that they might have in their hands, um, oral communication was, was sort of the driving factor. <clears throat> Even though there were books available and primers available, those were uh, read only, not read and write. And paper wasn't always readily available in many places. So oral exams uh, dominated and uh, report cards were less common. If we go, and I'm jumping around in time, um, there's a, an article I read about the 17th, a 17th century school in London where every Friday they examined the students orally in teams and the winning team took the upper seats in the room. And it was a revolving competition to try to take the highest seat in the room. And that was sort of a living report card, a visible assessment of how they were doing. And you could kind of see how you were performing by where you were sitting in the class. Um, in fact, if you go back to the uh, uh, 18, or go up to the 1850s, we would see that there were a number of sort of examination types. And uh, in one, one journal article that I'll mention in a moment, this is where I got this, um, but there were saying lessons, which were considered sort of quizzes. There were collections, which were more oral exams. And then, I love the, the terminology, there were trials. Um, those were written papers that uh, would be reviewed by the, the headmaster, who would then put them in a stack in the order of, of quality or excellence. And, um, and so students would sort of assess how they were doing by how they ranked against all of the others in the room. <clears throat> which makes sense if we look at the fact that the 1800s had these kinds of promise practices in, in um, the Western world. It makes sense why many schools gravitated toward class rank and toward uh, the idea of using a curve and, and, and things like that. Um, if we jump into the late 1800s, we find examples of using different marks. Uh, not, uh, letter grades weren't as commonplace but they would use phrases, phrases like, one mark would be for sort of the highest achievement, they go a little bit to the right for a medium achievement, and then uh, further to the right for something that's more deficient. And then we had, in the late 1800s, the 100-point scale that emerged of the late 19th century. Um, and, uh, and then in, the 19, in 1912, the numeric system got a challenge because there was a famous study that came out by Starch and Elliott that found huge discrepancies between different teachers' assessments of the same papers. And they found as much as a 40 to 50 point difference in the way that teachers graded the same papers. And, um, and as a result of that conversation, we started to see a shift to the letter grade system of A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's, or sometimes people would just use the numbers of one, two, three, four, and five. This is the source where my brief little history for you right now uh, came from. It actually comes from 1971. And I have to just quickly read to you a fascinating excerpt from that text. I probably should have done it in a different way. I would have made it more pro 
provocative. Let me see if I if I have that uh, text available here. So uh, the text, just one paragraph, it says, the present age is one of transition in higher education. The Amer American college is on trial. Condemnation is heard on every hand. The capital charge is preferred that there is a general demoralization of college standards, expressing the fact that as the college serves no particular educational purpose, it is immaterial whether the student takes the thing seriously or not. The college is charged with failure and pedagogical insight at each of the critical junctures of education so that a degree may be won with little or no systematic exertion. And as a result, our college students are said to emerge flighty, superficial, and immature, lacking as a class, lacking seriousness and thoroughness. Um, and she goes on to point out that that was actually not her making a statement in 1971. That was her making a quote from another article in 1911, which just resonates with me. Because I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty similar to today. But yeah, Jennifer, exactly. Um, so we could read that on the headlines of any number of, of um, articles in the contemporary world. And she goes on to talk about the concerns about the letter grade system and, and all sorts of things. And, and the person, um, uh, Louise Curtin, her big question as she started studying the letter grade system is, how do we decide what a passing grade is? So we say, like at her time, and I guess in her location, 70% was often said as passing. And, and she asked, well, why 70? Why not 69? Why 72? What, what makes this passing and the other number not passing? And she sort of persisted in asking that question and, and, um, and challenged the, the grading system with that question. Um, yes, again, these are questions that we ask today. So the topic for this course is really nothing new. It seems to have started not long after the letter grade system became popular in the late 1800s. And <laughs> a faculty meeting, Jennifer, yes, started in the late 1800s. And by 1912, we already had some uh, documented people challenging it. And maybe there were challenges when it first came to be as well. Just for fun, it's going to be hard to see some of these, but here are a couple of, um, of letter grades, of, of report cards from different times. This is from 1872, and I have the links to them, but uh, you can't read them well, so I put the, the uh, terms on the report card here on the left-hand side. The, the categories, the first row says credits obtainable, and it gives the number, and then credits obtained, it gives the number of credits obtained out of the number uh, obtainable. Then it gives you a percentage score. And then it gives you your position in class, your class rank. That one's not too different from some report cards in, in certain locations today. Or how about this one? This is supposedly Albert Einstein's <clears throat> report card. And uh, they used a number system uh, uh, to, to rank instead of letter grades. Or, I like this one. Now, I, <laughs> I have to think that they also had some other accompanying document, maybe another kind of report card. But uh, I thought this was an interesting uh, document from uh, the city of New York in the 1800s. So you got a report card that uh, made that emphatic statement, a good boy or a good girl. So it's good to know that they had one for both genders <laughs> represented here. Not a, um, an immense amount of detail in this type of a report card. But again, there were probably some uh, supplemental resources available as well. <clears throat> Although I would argue that sometimes uh, when we start to assess the, the letter grades and their accuracy, um, I'm not sure that letter grades tell us a lot more than these documents. Um, other times, we do a good job of articulating what they mean. <clears throat> then we have in 1913, we have uh, this report card. And notice that this one has things that we might uh, see in, in many report cards. We might see uh, effort and um, proficiency. So they did divide the grade into proficiency, which we would assume would relate to sort of competency with the, the content and the, the concepts in the class. But then they had a separate grade dedicated to effort. Um, 
Oh, I want to read Michelle's comment here quick. The report card I get, um, as mom tells me, almost nothing. I did not uh, even save it. I would uh, at least uh, save the good boy certificate. Yeah, that's the kind you'd put on the refrigerator, I suppose, right? <laughs> so uh, here's another one. Now, there's the rest of the report card I didn't put on the screen. But I thought this one was interesting because this seemed to be a, a sort of promising practice. 1915 to 16, we see that the report card requires the signature of the parent. And notice how frequently the report card is made available. They were distributing report cards on a monthly basis. Uh, I don't know how many of you are in a system where report cards are disseminated that frequently. frequently. Um, and I know that some require parent signatures today. But I thought this was an interesting one because it seemed to suggest that they were being uh, distributed frequently already back 1915-16. So the idea of progress reports and so forth that, that some schools use today, which seem to have a, a nice ethical um, value to them because they, they give people a chance to know how they're doing before it's too late. Um, and they have sort of this summative uh, grade that they can't really do anything about. Um, so I thought this was interesting that we go, goes all the way back to the 1900s. But then as we think about today and we think about, um, we think about report cards, we have many new possibilities that people are considering. And I offer for you these five to think about that's sort of part of the letter grade system. So one is uh, standards-based, where you might have a list of the standards that students are expected to meet on the actual report card. And then you can document their progress as it relates to each standard, which has the ability to give much more detail than a letter grade report card when we don't know necessarily, well, what part of the class did they do well in and what part of the class did they not do well in, right? So you might have, for example, a class where the teacher has 15 standards, but they base most of the grade on assessing five of the 15 standards. And so the student gets a D or an F. But in actuality, perhaps they... Um, Perhaps they got, um, uh, they had 10, 10 of the 15 standards uh, down. They, they had met them to some extent. Uh, Jennifer, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. That's a great question. Uh, so the um, competency-based badges, this is one that you're experiencing in the MOOC itself in a, in a small way where we distribute some kind of recognition or badge for meeting a certain standard. So we set certain criteria and we have sort of core assessments now, there is a limitation. For example, in this course, the limitation with the badges as we're using them, because we're not using expiration dates or anything like that, is that you're earning a badge for a one-time performance. So there's no evidence that you will have learned this and remembered it for 12 months, right? Of course, letter grades don't guarantee that either, but I'm just pointing out the limitation of badges as well that you may demonstrate your performance in one day, but that doesn't mean that you've retained it. And that's where formative uh, assessment becomes so critical, because in formative assessment, you're checking understanding throughout the learning experience, and they're getting more and more practice. And we know that more and more practice and repetition, um, and not mindless repetition, but sort of a healthy, positive repetition, can result in, in things going to your long-term memory and, and sticking with you um, for a longer period of time. And then we have gradeless report cards that can take any number of formats. And, uh, and so the, uh, obviously, the, obviously the critical nature of a gradeless report card is that it does not use grades. Uh, but instead, it might use certain, uh, certain terms or phrases. It might, uh, might have sort of exemplary or um, you'll see this in elementary schools often. It might say outstanding or developing or something like that. Or it might just have a... <clears throat> a uh, scale and you can kind of check on the scale how far they, they're progressing um, in a particular area. And in the bottom left hand corner we have portfolios and I suggest digital portfolios but um, non-digital portfolios are certainly a possibility as well. And, um, and this is one where we actually get to uh, we get to looking at the artifacts themselves. So a portfolio has the affordance of allowing one to not only say, well, how did you do, and just look at a grade and not know what that means, but we can actually look at the artifacts and, and we can judge for ourselves what, what they do and don't mean. The limitation of a portfolio in that sense is that um, it's harder to review and it's harder to kind of uh, generalize when people want to. And, 
sending your whole portfolio to someone to see how you performed, uh, that takes more time. It's, it's uh, a little length, lengthier. Jennifer, you brought a business scale, but basically the same thing is a grade. Certainly some people would, would make that critique of, of the gradeless report card as I just described it. But the gradeless report card could be uh, done in, in any number of ways as well. Uh, and uh, Heather, the difference between standards-based report cards and gradeless report cards. That's a great question. Let me just let me just look something up quickly. I actually wrote an article on this that's sort of sh that's short, and I'll share it with you if you want to go a little deeper into some of these. Um, the way that I represent gradeless report cards in the article, I, I say there are plenty of studies to indicate how uh, this one is often disliked for parents who grew up with letter grades. Um, it still uses standards, like the standards-based report card above, but it does not tend to evaluate terms, uh, use evaluative terms in it. So maybe I might have misrepresented it a little bit uh, uh, when I use the terms like outstanding. Um, it tends to, it uh, doesn't tend to list actual grades. It includes uh, oftentimes like a, a rubric with standard statements of performance organized from high to low. Um, and so they try to make it less uh, sort of evaluative or at least less of a judgment and more of just sort of a, um, um, an accurate picture of where you stand at this point. Um, so the teacher's focus is upon monitoring and documenting learning, not really rating it. So the gradeless report card is simply saying, this is what I see, this is what I observe. I observe you have done this. Um, so it's not, and it tends to be um, more positive in nature as well. Um, I don't know if a gradeless, I'm sure that gradeless report cards in some formats could actually, could have things that people maybe haven't accomplished yet. But the idea behind it, I think some people in the positive education movement have also sort of embraced this as one possibility where the positive education movement seeks to focus upon the strengths rather than the weaknesses or limitations of students. Um, keep in mind that all of these uh, that the, we can the, the terminology fluctuates in education. We're great at using terms and then having a half a dozen definitions. So they're they're valuable, but they're rafts that we use to get across the river, and then we just get rid of the raft. The terminology we don't necessarily always have to use, but they can at least uh, help us think about different models of report cards and and uh, uh, and so forth. By the way, we're talking about report cards, and so we are looking at things that tend to be a little bit more summative. In nature at this point, but a lot of what we're exploring in the class is going to focus more on the formative side. Um, so the digital portfolios, an opportunity that have the actual artifacts, and then we have narrative report cards that are just what it, uh, they, they sound like, where one is, is writing a more lengthy narrative. One of the limitations is obviously it takes a lot more time to write a narrative report card, um, and if something takes more time, we're less likely to do as, as frequently probably. But it, the, its benefit it, it, it is that it, it, is very pers it can be personalized. It can be a very rich description for anyone in, in research, us qualitative researchers. We look at uh, uh, rich description. That's why we like qualitative research. It sort of tells a story, and it, it goes, does more than just give a, uh, a number to someone. It sort of describes them, what they, what they look like, and um, puts it in context. Um, and so these are five of many possibilities that, uh, that one can consider in place of those historic report cards. Let me just stop here. So the gradeless report does not have a cumulative mark. It's a real-time observation of learning. Aaron, that's how I understand it to be used oftentimes, yes, that it, it tends to be more of a um, sort of a, yeah, a picture, a, a picture of where they are. Um, so here's the other one. As I got interested in letter grades, the second topic I jumped to after just playing around with report cards is I jumped to the syllabus. And this is where you, you will, if you started, how many of you have started on the badge, the affordances and limitations badge? Anyone in here? <clears throat> I know I have some that were submitted and I have to take a look at them. I know some were submitted yesterday and uh, last night and today. Um, so the syllabus is really what got me into this. And I mentioned this in one of my videos as well that I started analyzing syllabi, and I started looking at the way that things were weighted. And this is actually the, the um, artifact that one has to analyze in order to earn the affordances and limitations badge, is you have to find a syllabus and analyze the way that the grading scale is used and answer some questions like, what's the best possible grade one can get while knowing very little? 
and what's the worst possible grade one can get while knowing a lot in the class. And um, from the badges that I reviewed, there were some real eye openers. In fact, if you look on Twitter, you'll find some people um, who wrote their answers in, a, in their blog and they link to it. So if you look at the Twitter hashtag, um, Fred uh, on Twitter analyzed the syllabus and he did a really great job and he posted it publicly so you can read and get a, a worked example if you, if you want one before you try it yourself. But this was eye-opening for me. So the reason that I have that as the, the core assignment to earn that badge is because this was the assignment that woke me up to the potential limitations of the letter grade system as we use them. As I started going through syllabus after syllabus after syllabus, I realized the kinds of limitations that exist. I also noticed some affordances and some benefits, and I learned a lot from the wonderful syllabi that colleagues had put together. Um, and I do plan to actually conduct a more formal study and uh, try to publish eventually uh, an analysis of syllabi on uh, the high school and then a separate set on the university level and uh, representing the types of grades that one can earn while knowing a great deal or knowing very little. Um, so the syllabus was the next one. And then after the syllabus, I thought, well, I might as well just dive into the whole letter grade system. Uh, and that's where I came back to the concept of this course, um, the letter grade system. Of course, we have to ask ourselves, well, is there anyone who's not using the letter grade system? And it often comes back to the elementary schools do not want to abandon the system, even if they're considering it, because the high schools use it. And the high schools often are the secondary schools, so primary and, and, and secondary. The secondary schools don't want to uh, abandon it because the tertiary or the higher education institutions use it. And so I did spend some time over the last couple of years learning more about the institutions that do not use letter grades. So if you're interested, I give you a list of some of the universities in the United States that do not use letter grades, um, or they minimize their use of letter grades. And, um, and so you can do a quick search on some of these, and most of their sites have pages that describe the alternate system that they use. I live here just north of Milwaukee in Wisconsin, and so Alverno College is very close to me. And, um, and they're, one of, they're known around the country for their creative um, approach to assessment, alternative assessments, and using rubrics and other things like that. Um, so uh, this is on the higher education level, but we have many people who are in elementary and secondary uh, schools also. And I haven't taken the time to um, document those because some of those schools don't necessarily have as, as uh, obvious of an online presence where it's easy to go and and fine. Some of them do, but, but not as many. And, and these sites um, have some pages sort of dedicated to their system. Um, but uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at some of these and uh, look at some of them have examples of what they look like. And you could even do some searches. And if you just type any of these colleges and type letter grades or assessment or something like that, you'll find a number of articles and um, examples of them. I'm a big fan of worked examples. I need to see something in the concrete in a, in a really practical way to, to make sense of it sometimes. So that brings us back to sort of the end here. And we have some time for Q&A, which is, so what do I mean by learning beyond letter grades and this course? Um, I did mention this a couple times in videos and in some of the areas, but I think it's, it's appropriate that I sort of finish with uh, this explanation as well. The purpose of this course is not to argue that we should eradicate the world of evil letter grades or anything like that. It's simply, as I started, challenging us to consider the affordances and the limitations of the current system and considering existing possibilities, others that might be better. Just as I shared with that sort of medical technology of, of a long time ago, there are actually medical technologies that look very similar today than they did 200 years ago. So there are some systems, some tools that are tried and true. Stethoscopes, I'm sure, are new and improved, but they sort of look pretty similar to what they looked like 100 years ago as you sort of look at different pictures. Um, by the way, if you're curious, I, I got intrigued by this whole medical technology and 
Um, if you want to be horrified, you can just do a, a search for um, historical medical devices, and you'll find these really intriguing blogs of people who enjoy logging these um, what look like uh, tools for punishment <laughs> more than medical devices. Um, so the, I, I say that in jest, in, and yet there are some people who take a stronger stand against letter grades, and they would argue that they are tools for punishment today. There is, there are, I do leverage some of those authors in our course to give us a chance to view all perspectives. I don't take quite as extreme of a position as some of those others might. I'm just interested in exploring the possibilities. But you'll find Alfie Cohn, for example, um, there's an article for him in the Affordances and uh, Benefits um, module. But if you Google Alfie Cohn, he has a website that is just rich with a myriad of articles. He's written a number of books that address specifically the letter grade system and rewards and punishments. And he has some strong critiques about many of those things. And, um, and so I think it's valuable for us to look at that perspective. I also try to take a look at uh, some of the... Um, uh, some of the other side, people who are, who are strongly defending letter grades. And I've tried to represent that in the affordances and benefits module where I share some of the arguments in favor of letter grades. And I think some of them are valid. Um, I think all of them are, are valid. They're worthy of our consideration. Um, like that last one, um, they're working all right, so why change? Um, and that may be true in, in many instances that people are experiencing that, or given all of the different things that we could address in um, our educational institutions. Is this the load-bearing wall we want to invest so much time and energy in? Well, that's going to depend upon your context. I don't think we can make one unilateral decision for the entire global education system on, on, in, on that. But we can explore it together and see where it takes us. And that's the purpose of this course. So I'm going to stop there and give you guys a chance to ask some questions. You're welcome to ask questions about what I've presented tonight, but you can also ask questions just more generally about the course. And as we do this, I'm going to flip back to the, um, the other page so that you can fill out some of the polls that I have if you didn't do that earlier. Before I do that, I'm just going to check. I want to make sure I read some of the comments here. Aaron wrote, I'm very interested in the alternative system at the university level and what the graduation requirements are if they're not using or distributing grades. If anyone has more resources, please share. Aaron, I have some of those um, that I'll, I'll try to pull out. If you don't mind sending me a message, even on um, Twitter or uh, in the Google community, or you can just go to um, Beyond Letter Grades and click on the questions. There's a form to fill out. If you remind me of that, I'll try to remember to put some of that together for you. Because, um, yeah, there's some, some, great, uh, some, some great resources out there. Um, I don't have anything in, it in a really formal uh, format uh, yet, but I have some stuff that might be of interest to you, some articles to read. And again, those websites, uh, the websites of those schools will be helpful. Um, Jennifer uh, mentioned the Minerva Project as an, as an option as well. Jennifer, I've started to learn more about the Minerva Project as this sort of uh, online hybrid um, university that's going to try to challenge the academic quality or meet the academic quality of, of the elite schools. Um, are they using something rather than a traditional letter grade system? They're using a lot more formative feedback as well, I, I recall. Um, if you could share a little bit more of what you know about it, that'd be great. Um, and then we also have um, a new undergraduate, uni oh, you're right, right, right there. I see you're having that conversation about it. Um, what do you do about accreditation if you don't do grades? Well, the schools that I listed before, to the best of my knowledge, all of those are regionally accredited schools, and they have worked through accreditation. Um, as far as I know, the accrediting bodies do not require that we use a specific letter grade system, but that we simply have an assessment process, a reasonable assessment process in place. Um, and I'm speaking to the... Uh, United States, uh, the crediting system as I know it in the United States uh, primarily here.
I'm going to flip over to the polls, um, but I think all the questions should still stay. Yep, they're still there. So Heather wrote, does anyone know of a high school that does not use letter grades? There are a number of high schools, Heather, that don't use letter grades. In fact, I think if you look in the Google Plus community, you'll find one or two people in this course who mentioned that they are principals at schools that, that do not use letter grades, or they have been in schools that do not. So you could possibly connect with them directly and get some insights. The one, um, one of the people mentioned that uh, he's done it, but he, the big question that he has is um, the biggest resistance he, he got, it was from the parents. And so um, he's really interested in exploring with other people in this class how you might address that. Um, and that's true. As I've talked to many people in schools that have experimented with alternative uh, assessments, that they found that parents were among the most resistant because they know uh, or they, they have a sense of what an A is versus a B and a C. And, and that's what they grew up with. And so um, it's, it's hard to kind of break that habit when, when people sort of expect it and, and they want to have good feedback on how their kids are doing. Then Jennifer wrote, what do students think about the formats? And uh, I think that's a really great perspective to ask Jennifer. In fact, that would be intriguing. If some of us could do that in this course, that would be neat if we could even create a, a Google Hangout or maybe in one of our upcoming webinars, we might even try to pull together a panel of uh, students of different ages to talk about their perspectives on the letter grade system or alternatives to them and what they see as the benefits and limits. Um, or maybe some people in this class could, uh, could interview informally students that they interact with and bring some of that information back to the Google community. That would be really rich. That's a great question. Aaron wrote, Heather and I both work in international schools and the question at the high school level is whether kids will get acceptance into Ivy League schools if they come from standards-based report cards? It's a great question, and I've had some conversations with people about that, and, um, and my understanding is that the vast majority of universities um, look at the full package. And uh, there are, for example, homeschoolers who have gotten into pr to every elite school in the United States. Um, and They've done so oftentimes having to demonstrate their preparation in different ways. There are um, a number of interesting texts out there. And let me see if I can find um, the one that I recently read. It's sort of a how-to book. Some of the, the literature that I got into as I've explored this topic is from the unschooling movement. So it's the homeschooling movement that believes in a largely sort of unscripted curriculum. The curriculum is really driven and decided and created by the learner. And, um, and so uh, they write texts um, oftentimes within those communities um, and provide some really interesting insights on kind of uh, getting into college in these alternate routes. And there's one that's called something like, uh, oh, it's called something like College Without High School. But um, I just did a quick search, and that didn't show up, and I don't have my library. Oh, there it is. It's called uh, College Without High School, A Teenager's Guide to Skipping High School and Going to College. This is by Blake Bowles. He's written a lot of sort of self-directed learning type stuff, and I just put it in the, in the chat here. should show up for you. Um, and that one you might want to check out from a library and peek through it. It's not a really deep like academic book, but it has sort of practical tips to kids. And it might also give a glimpse of sort of how, uh, how different universities review um, atypical um, portfolios that, that students put into their application. <clears throat> Let's go to uh, John here. John wrote, oh, I want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Aaron wrote, we're seeing an elementary, middle school, but high school is tough, yeah. Um, in the context of load-bearing walls, I wonder if there are schools that have only changed grading system while keeping other aspects of their program more traditional. That, too, is a really interesting question, uh, John. And um, I suspect that many times the change with this load-bearing wall comes because of a desire to renovate a different part of the house, sticking with the metaphor, or the school. 
So for example, I have, uh, I visit a lot of alternative schools. I'm actually on the governance board of a project-based blended learning global school called uh, KM Global that's located here in, in, um, in Wisconsin. And, um, and so many schools like a KM Global have uh, moved to more of a project student directed project based learning and um, they do still take some AP courses and things like that advanced placement courses and so forth but many of those schools have looked for alternative assessment approaches because they aligned more closely with project based learning or some other approach to learning that was going to be a school shaping concept for them um, so I see them mostly coming in parallel with some other innovations or changes. Um, I haven't interacted with a lot that have just sort of gotten rid of, of uh, the traditional letter grade system, but kept everything else pretty much the same. Um, but there probably are some, I'm just not aware. Now, we're, um, we're at the end of the time, but I'm, so I'm gonna stop the recording now, but I will stick around and field some questions. If you wanna use your microphone and talk as well, that's great, but I'll stick around um, for a little while longer if people want to chat.